Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading property experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, and Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investment Professionals of Australia, and the 2014 and 2015 Property Investment Advisor of the Year. All right, folks, you're on The Property Couch, where each week Ben and I bring you the Insider's Guide to Property Finance and Money Management. Welcome back to The Couch, mate. Thanks, mate. Always good to have a chat. I know. Hey, um, we've got a very special guest today. Before we, we get there, there's a couple of things we've got to chat about. Um, our location score is continuing to go well, Ben, yep. which is encouraging that there's an appetite for that. Uh, we've had some new REA videos go out, they're realestate.com.au. So if you haven't checked those out, Ben, where they need to go to Well, yeah, again, once you get used to my pink nose and pink lips and running nose and the fact that it was minus 14 degrees when we filmed and yeah, I was on the beach and the wind chill factor was amazing. Yeah, so check them out. So if you're, just, not, in, if you're not interested in our message, folks, just, get, just, <laughs> just go, go and check that out. The nose check. matching the collar is oh, well worth the effort, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Root off the red nose reindeer there, that's for sure. And of course, we announced a couple of weeks, Ben, but just reminding our folks, there's a new way to give questions on this podcast. There is. You can go to thepropertycouch.com.au and there's a little widget at the side, Ben, whether you're on your mobile phone or whether you're on a uh, desktop, and you can leave us a voicemail. And here's the deal. Oh, if you do, we will prioritise your question. Ooh. So effectively, if you want to hear your own voice on this podcast, go and leave us a message. You've got, uh, I think it's 90 seconds to leave that message. We'll cover it off, Ben, and we will prioritise those ones. Sounds good. Um, that are on voicemail. So um, uh, thanks to Ivis and the crew uh, for getting that up. Uh, I think that's a good innovation for us. And before we get on to our very special guest, Ben, my uh, mindset unit is very simple. Uh, Success is neither magical nor mysterious. Success is the natural consequence of consistently applying the basic fundamentals, and that's a Jim Rohn classic. And I chose that one specifically uh, because I recently caught up with our very special guest uh, a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And uh, it'd be fair to say that Duncan is a natural consequence of consistently applying the basic fundamentals because he's been very, very successful uh, in building his business and also in real estate. So uh, without further ado, welcome Duncan to the podcast. Thanks fellas, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. For those of you that don't know Duncan McPherson, he's uh, a director, he's on the board, he's sales director at Nelson Alexander, which is a very recognisable brand here, Ben, uh, in Melbourne. He's uh, highly respected and sought after not only just sits in the ivory tower, but he's still out listing. He is. And uh, selling and properties. And and getting out. And doing a very good job. Started the career in 1991, uh, and he's very, very passionate about property. It definitely shows if you attend any of his auctions, you'll see that he's entertaining crowds. But he loves, this is what I love about him, Ben. He loves uh, spending time with his uh, wife and children, as well as um, being successful. So there's a fair bit going on for you. There is a bit going on, and I think that's um, probably the, the key to it all, is a bit of balance. And I think that's quite often what we we lack and what I see is the challenge with my staff is to get some balance into their life to make sure that they can balance all those things together and that's when I think you can really be proud of your achievements and uh, and enjoy life. Now you always, I mean the the, the Nelson Alexander brand is is, um, synonymous in... Recently uh, changed. We yeah, a bit of a rebrand, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. So talk, talk us through that because it was a, a very recognisable brand and then yeah. now you've got uh, yes. this funky, dynamic 21st <laughs> century look. <laughs> well, there was a lot of effort that went into it and there was a lot of contemplation about it because the brand was red, white and blue and it was mm. uh, a brand name that was well recognised and our colours were well, well recognised. But we just felt that, um, you know, we've been in a business a long time and we employed all the experts, which we tend to do and try to do when we want a change. We try and source as much valuable information as we can to make sure that we're making a balanced decision. And the decision was made that the name, uh, and people call us colloquial, Nelsons, right? Mm, okay. We yeah. thought, do we go down the Nelsons path or do we go Nelson Alexander? And the, the information that we got back was congruent with our feelings is that Nelson Alexander is who we are and what we do. Mm -hmm. So then we looked at the brand and and thought it could do with a bit of an update and uh, got away from the traditional colours and uh, I think the colours classified as eggplant, um, (laughs) which is uh, an interesting colour. But look, change is never easy and I think there's always resistance to change. But once you embrace change and go with it, then I think you can look back and reflect upon it and quite often it's it's the right decision and we're very happy with how things are progressing. It is a work in progress yeah. as life is, you know. It's never perfect first up, but it's a work in progress. And so let's talk, let's get the backstory of Nelson Alexander just yep. quickly. So how did it all start? And Well, a gentleman by the name of Peter Nelson, who's one of my mentors and a man I love dearly, started the company in uh, Fitzroy about 35 years ago. And when Peter Nelson started in Fitzroy, um, Fitzroy was a fairly... Uh, 
say, grubby suburb, mm-hmm. and Peter could sell houses in Carlton, all right, but he couldn't drag them across Johnson Street or Nicholson <laughs> Street to get into Fitzroy. So that's where it started. Yep. When I joined the company, and um, there's a story... How laughable is that now? Oh, oh, no. well, yeah. well, it's, that it's, Clifton Hill, Fitzroy. There's that, that consistency, because when I opened Brunswick, People said, where did you, you know, where's your office? I said, Brunswick. And they go, Brunswick, oh. <laughs> and now they say, Brunswick, ah. It's just a different infliction on the same. So it's wonderful how things change. But he started in Fitzroy and then um, he brought another company or merged with another company called Alan Alexander who had an office in Carlton who was a, a powerhouse in Carlton and hence the name Nelson Alexander. Then over time, uh, Alan Alexander retired or moved out of the business and business, Peter Nelson just kept the name Nelson Alexander and it sort of grown from there. Mm. When I joined the company, there was three offices. There was an office in Fitzroy, an office in Northcote and an office in North Carlton. Shortly thereafter, we closed the North Carlton office and I opened the Brunswick office. And that was um, a fair time ago now. That was three offices and we're now at 16. Mm. Uh, I think 330 on the staff, on the payroll. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been a great journey. Is there any brand in Melbourne that's got more than 16? There's franchises, but we're not a franchise. We're wholly owned, and I think that's our point of difference in the marketplace. And there's a bit of um, thinking behind that as well in the sense that um, when I first got into real estate and my very first job in real estate was with a small company, and it was, I think, the uh, owner at that stage ran by the sort of the the rule or the rule of thumb was he who dies with the most toys wins. (laughs) And that (laughs) didn't sort of resonate with me because I thought if you're going to build something and grow something you really need to empower people so it started as three and then it's just grown organically from there over time it's interesting i drove past um um, as most people know i eat grass according to you but uh (laughs) i uh i drove very healthy very healthy i drove past uh, mcdonald's the other days and i saw for the first time the golden i can't remember where it was but had maccas instead of mcdonald's Ah. and it's like what you said before about nelson's versus nelson it just didn't seem right even though we call it maccas yes it it didn't seem right so i think uh, you know in well, my humble go. opinion, Nelson Alexander was probably the right thing to do. Although to it probably doesn't, probably doesn't rate that highly in your well, you're gonna get, I mean, going to get people like saying, well, what about Qantas? You know, mm. they've been going yep. for almost 100 years and they just tweaked their their sort of font. Yes. But kept the you know kept everything else pretty much the same yep. to bond. So it's interesting, isn't it? It is. You go to the experts and everyone's going to have an opinion, but the reality is it's out there and you're not going to come back from it. So, Correct. you know, positive thinking, you know, sort of useful belief. That's it. That's it. It's good. Let's keep change. Let's keep moving forward with it. Correct. Hey, we caught up a couple of, yep. a couple of weeks ago for coffee and the, the story about how you got into real estate was really interesting. Uh, <laughs> I think it's got something to do with a butcher, right? <laughs> well, yeah, look, uh, I guess my my journey into real estate's uh, probably a bit unusual in the sense that um, I was given some very good advice as a 16-year-old when I failed year 11 and that was to get out of school. Uh, <laughs> that was good advice because uh, I did precisely that and my dear dad, my dear late dad, uh, decided that uh, he'd give me a job and dad was a butcher of a generation of butchers and he gave me a job as a butcher. So that's how I started my working career and then um, when I came to Melbourne a few years later I um, was working as a butcher and I met a lady, beautiful lady and we decided we should get married or she decided we should get married and um, so we were looking for a home. So I rolled up to this first home and I had a 1972 Volkswagen, it was my pride and joy, I thought I was very smart in that and rolled up to this home with a butcher's coat on with a bit of uh, blood and bits and pieces (laughs) on it and uh, this gentleman rolled up and he was in a beautiful black BMW and a shiny suit. And he he treated me like a complete fool. And I thought, well, if I couldn't do a better job than you, mate, I'll eat my hat. So that was not the catalyst, but it was something that opened my eyes to say, gee whiz, you know, I don't know if selling meat or being in sales and being in real estate is that much different. If you treat people properly and treat them with respect, then I think there's a fair chance you'll be successful. Did you end up buying that house? I did, in fact, buy that house. <laughs> so and, all uh, of a sudden, you became his best friend. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Look, his, uh, his follow-up was an exception, I'll put it that way. But, <laughs> but there is a, a bit of a line to the story. This, uh, this gentleman that uh, treated me in that manner, many years later, after I got into real estate, and then I joined Nelson Alexander, I had the uh, distinct pleasure. He was a partner in a business, and we bought that business. And it's fair to say that uh, the Maybe gentleman nice. didn't make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> How did that chat go? <laughs> uh, it was quite amicable. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so obviously there's the entree to that, but how did you transition from being a butcher to actually becoming a listing agent? Well, I can explain that I came to Melbourne as a consultant for master butchers. That's how I came to Melbourne. And in those days, uh, butchers sold meat by the side, but side of lamb and mum would have the roast leg on a Saturday and chops through the week and the dog would get the flank and the shank and the neck and all the rest of it. <laughs> they fed the whole family, dogs and cats included. And then women started working, which was a real change. And I know I'm sounding old when I say this, but 
Then where you had the advent of the working women and women didn't buy meat in the same manner. They wanted portion control. They wanted those that you buy six chops or 12 pieces of this or something like that. So butchers had a bit of a trouble struggling with that change and I came across as a consultant for Master Butchers teaching butchers oven ready product and how to value add to their product. So for example, rather than sell Mrs Jones a piece of fillet steak, if you took a piece of fillet steak, put some pate on top, wrap it in your oven puff pastry and made a beef wellington, she could buy a portion control for six guests and you could end up getting twice the price of your fillet steak by wrapping it up in a bit of pastry and putting some pate on it. So that's, uh, that was a value add from my <laughs> that mind. That is a value add, all right. And um, so I was working as a butcher and my wife had a beauty clinic at the time and uh, I decided that real estate was my calling. And I'd always loved property, I, I, I guess I'd followed it from an early age when I travelled overseas as a young fellow when I first came home stone broke the first thing I wanted to do was buy a property and I did and that was actually my entree back into the property market so I thought property would be the go. I was playing football at that stage to get a bit extra coin and help balance the budget and uh, I just had my face smashed in and the first job I went to real estate and this is interesting because I went and I had a slice of hip removed stuck up my nose with two steel pins hanging out the front and I walked into a real estate job that I saw advertised in the paper and it was one of the great lessons in life because what it was it was the most diabolical toxic office environment I've ever experienced but what the lesson was out of it I got that I, if I ever had the opportunity to run a business, I would never run it in that manner. Mm. Uh, staff were just cannon fodder. It was like diving into a pool filled with piranhas. You either sunk or you swim. I was lucky enough to, to swim and get out the other end, and that's when I uh, uh, approached Nelson Alexander for a job, and I've been there ever since. Because, mm. um, I mean, you're part of their history. It's, it, I mean, you've seen a bit, as you said, going across Johnston Street was something they didn't do back then. What, yep. what have you seen evolve and change in Melbourne real estate? Because now people are scrambling to go that side of Johnston Street. Yeah, right. look, it's, it's really interesting in the sense that, uh, again, because I, I, I'm a country boy, I probably have that country element through me. But when I first came to Melbourne, I couldn't believe that people would drive an hour, an hour and a half to get to work and an hour and a half on the way home. If you're in the country and you did that, that'd lock you up, you know, they'd, you'd be crazy. So my concept was really simple. I wanted to live as close to the city as I could. The benefits of that I found were infrastructure and trams and transport and those sorts of things. Again, being from the country, I didn't like traffic too much, so I, I wanted to be accessible to all the good things that I wanted out of city living. And I think that's the thing that we've seen over the years where the unfashionable suburbs, the Fitzroy's, the Brunswick's, you know, even the Northcote's have evolved and gentrified. When I first started in Brunswick, Brunswick was the highest turnover suburb in Melbourne. Mm. A lot of ethnic people that started their families there, they've My got a few right, bucks yeah. together yeah. and then they wanted out. And then the people that were coming in were the, the young people. And what's happened, the turnover now in Brunswick, for example, has dropped off. It's not even in the top 20 suburbs in Melbourne because people move in and they won't move out because they enjoy the amenity and the lifestyle and the convenience so much that they don't want to go. They'll no. improve. And as, a, as an estate agent, you want to, no? <laughs> well, that's right. So that's why you've got to develop other markets. But yes, that's, that's the thing. And we, I think we're seeing that in the marketplace at the moment. Volume is down. And yes, transaction costs are high, but in the suburbs that we work are mainly lifestyle suburbs, and people enjoy the lifestyle. So they'll improve the property, they'll renovate the property, they'll extend the property, but it's hard for them to move. Uh, in terms of your, because I, I know that you're personally a property investor yourself and mm -hmm. largely our podcast is um, primarily for property investors. How have you approached uh, property investing over the journey and has there been any changes along the way or have you been sort of firm on your approach? Look, uh, I guess two things I need to explain. And one is I'm a country boy and two is I'm Scottish. So the reality <laughs> is I, I like to buy property but I don't like to sell it. Now yeah. in saying that, there's certain times where I've had to sell, of course, to trade up for the family home and those sorts of things. But... I believe if, um, if, if you can buy and hang on to it and hold it and that's how you accumulate wealth and it's a legacy that I want to leave for my kids. So from my point of view, again, this country element is I want to be as close to the city as I can. I want infrastructure, I want amenity, I want convenience. So I follow tram lines and train lines. Um, my personal preference is I don't buy anything outside probably the 5 to 10k radius. I think also if you follow that through from an investment point of view, and particularly areas like Brunswick, you know, think about it, it's got four trams and a train, and at the end of those facilities are the, you know, if you think about it, the hospitals, the university, the CBD, so you're always gonna get tenants. 
and the tenants want the lifestyle as well. Mm. So mm. invest where you're going to get a quality tenant. Buy a quality house, get a good tenant, get a quality rent. I reckon that's about it. It's pretty simple. And Duncan, any views on apartments, townhouses versus freestanding houses? Yeah, again, I'll, I'll relay a story that was uh, communicated to me many years ago when I first got into real estate. My wife had a client. He was a, a very successful Jewish man. And he, I first got into real estate and I, I met him and he, uh, he said, So, Duncan, so what do you buy when you buy property? I said, well, you buy, you buy shelter. It's a fundamental human existence, number one. He said, that's not exactly the answer I was looking for. I said, well, you buy lifestyle, amenity, convenience. He said, no, 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 what do you really buy? And I was a bit tricked. And he said, you buy one of two things. You buy land or you buy airspace. That's what you buy, mm. right? He said, anything on that will depreciate over time, and that's why the government give you a depreciation allowance. He said, think about it, but land and airspace. So I, I follow that pretty much through. I like the land component. I'm not afraid of units as long as they're old, established blocks, the so 60s and 70s blocks. I, I have, a again, the Scottish part of me, I really struggle with big body corporates because I just don't see the value in them. So I won't buy anything with a lift in it. I'll walk up blocks or single front cottages, anything like that, villa units I'm a fan of, and in those locations close to town where you've got amenity. Mm. Gee, that's, you're singing from the same hymn book as us, mate. That's what we well, bang on about. <laughs> so well, I don't good. know. I mean, I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm not that well educated, but it just seems fundamental to me that that's, you know, that, that's work for me. And I'm a bit like that. I'll stick to my knitting. If it's working, why change it? What about value add? Have you sort of put any... Yeah, the beef wellington, Ben. Have you yeah. put any pate and wrapped <laughs> yeah. it? Have you wrapped well, any yeah, pate uh, and a bit yeah, of we, filo pastry? <laughs> we did... Uh, I, I bought a block recently, or a couple of years ago, a small block of flats had a big piece of parcel of land on the back of it and what we decided was that we'd um, develop the back and put some more units on that. So we did that and we value added to it and we built new and then we refurbished the existing and then we sold out of them because we thought what's the point of holding them? Might as well sell out of them and use that money for something else. So that's what we did. So I've done a bit of that but yeah I always like to be able to add some value to something and mm -hmm. if you take a long-term view there might be a couple of renovations in a house through its lifetime. You know what I mean? Put your tenants in there, everything's going well. We've got a property in uh, Ascadvar. We just recently did that. It came to the end of its lifespan, so we rejuvenated it, mm. renovated it, gave it an, an appropriate renovation, not over the top, but it made it very comfortable. Put some new tenants in. Now, hopefully, in another 15 or 20 years' time, we'll probably do it again. Mm. But mm. yeah, so add values, not a problem. Turn apples into apple pie. When we caught up, you told that story um, where you went to a conference and there was a, a bunch of sharp CEOs that was slightly intimidating, but um, then when they realised you are at Nelson Alexander, they started chatting. Can you recall that story? Well, yeah, it's, um, I did a uh, director's course at the Australian Institute of Company Directors and there were some pretty heavy hitters in the room and uh, I was, uh, quite frankly, quite intimidated because it was uh, basically about boards and their structures and their compliance and all the things that responsibilities of a board and reading financial statements and understanding all that but uh, it was interesting in the breaks a number of people came up to me and they they knew the brand they dealt with the brand and they were very happy to have dealt with the brand and it had been a positive experience so uh, it was certainly something that uh, I took out of that that I thought was uh, most enjoyable. The interesting part about that Ben was because um, I was I was having coffee with uh, Duncan and his financial planner because yep. he was slightly intimidated by these people but if, if I said well if you had pulled your balance sheet out you probably would have <laughs> and the smirk on his face and the, they, they said nothing they had this smirk on their face as if yeah, yeah we would have yeah, probably right. yeah, I'll see you. Um, which is a good thing because you have been a long-term accumulator of yep. property can you remember the first one and do you still own it? No, well, I did say that sometimes you have to trade. The very first property when I came home from overseas as a 21-year-old with not a cracker in my pocket, I still went back to uh, the country where I lived and I wanted to buy a property and I hunted around and the only property I found, because I didn't want to be... I had horses and things, I wanted a bit of rural land, so I bought a country... It was an old country school on three-quarters of an acre just outside my hometown, close to the family farm, and I bought that. And I think, from memory, I paid $9,000 for it. <laughs> and then when I moved to Melbourne, I sold it for a princely sum of $19,000. And that was enough to get me a deposit on a property in Melbourne, and, or part deposit, with my wife's help. We got a, a little place. And I just sort of, that was a, the penny dropped, thought, OK, I wouldn't have been able to save that money. I've made it and tip it into, into something now for the future. So country boy, whereabouts? Mount Gambier in South Australia. Okay. Yeah, yep. Yep. across the border. Across the border. Crows, Port Adelaide? Well, no, no, well, that's another story. Um, no, I, uh, I did a pre-season one year with Port Adelaide and uh, 
they uh, they sent me home. <laughs> I was a shocking kick, and I couldn't handball, and left or right, and I only had right foot, and that wasn't much chop. But besides that, you're a great asset yeah. to the team. Well, <laughs> it's interesting talking about people that influence you. I had a football coach when I came back to Mount Gambier, a bloke by the name of Wayne Fletcher, who's now up in Queensland. He taught me a valuable lesson in life, and that was if you work really, really hard, you don't have to be brilliant. He said this... He's seen many footballers are absolutely brilliant, but they had no work ethic. Mm. And he said, I'd trade someone with a really strong work ethic and a real strong determination over a personal or natural ability. And that was a good lesson for me. And I think uh, I can sort of credit Fletch in many regards to part of my journey is that uh, he installed in me that real strong work ethic. Hustle beats talent when talent won't hustle. Correct. Mm. That's a fair way. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, Can you give um, the listeners an insider's view on what it's like to be a listing agent? And a lot of buyers are surprised at how big the off-market space actually is. Yeah. Um, So uh, two parts. How can buyers get the best out of um, dealing with a real estate agent? Because they don't clock on on Monday at 9 o'clock and clock off on Friday. They're in a results-based business. And then can you talk a little bit about off-market as well? Sure. Look, uh, what I've tried to run my career on is is communication and trust and that's not easy to uh, gain immediately but if you can find an agent that um, you feel comfortable with and uh, the reality is they want to help you right the market is the market but agents really all they really want to do is be able to help you the good and ones, the good ones yeah. and our philosophy is you have a client for life so if I meet either of you and we're out looking at properties, my expectation and my modus operandi would be to help you through your process. And I think that's another really important thing for a life lesson is if you help people achieve their goals, that's how you achieve your own. Mm-hmm. And, and if I can assist you and find you the right property and give you good advice, then we build trust, we build rapport, you take that advice on, you secure the property, 10 years down the track, if you want to buy another property or something, you, you feel comfortable coming back to me. And that's how we like to run our business. Off-market sales, and we're starting to see a little bit more of that at the moment. I think there's a, just been a little bit of steam that's come out of the property market at the moment. And we're seeing a little bit more off-market. And I think that's also in part due to the changes in legislation in regards to quoting. Um, off-market sales, you know, they are about, in fact, we sell about 20% of our properties off-market that people don't even recognise. That's a surprise to a lot of people. Yeah. There, yeah. Is this, there is this market that um, a lot of people aren't accessing because it doesn't doesn't hit the portals and it doesn't have a sale sign yeah. at the front. Is yeah. that across the network? Yeah, that'd be about right. Yeah. So And so how many properties are you transacting per annum across your network? Oh, God. Now you've got me tricked. <laughs> <laughs> lots? Yeah, lots. lots. Well, in, anything. I mean, yeah. if, even if it's a 1,000, that's still 20%. That's yeah. still 200 off market that people yeah. mightn't get to. Yeah. So hence getting that relationship and maybe telling the selling agent that, look, I'm a serious buyer. I might I might play a couple of cards to my chest, but I'm sure. a serious buyer and this is my range. Yeah. What can, you know, if anything comes up, Correct. keep me in the loop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's and that's just that open communication. That, and sometimes I understand that buyers are reluctant to communicate that and be too open. They want to feel a bit protected, and I understand that as well. But if you can find an agent that does give you that confidence, then invest in that confidence. And, and again, you might be surprised at the outcomes you can achieve. Well, that's right. I mean, as a buyer's agent, we don't necessarily do that. We're, you know, once we build a relationship with the agents and we've bought many properties off them, We'll say we've got a buyer at six fifty. Yep. You know, and you'll know there if it's if it's thereabouts or on the money, and and that there's no holding back. It's just Correct. like the deal. And I don't want to waste your time. Correct. You know what and I mean? Vice if it's, versa. If it's if it's not going to fall within your price bracket, I'd much prefer to say that to you yeah. and say, well, that doesn't. But what about this? Mm. How would that work for your client? Yep. You know? yep. And together you can get the outcomes you desire. That's all you've got to sell is your time. So you yeah. you you don't want to waste that with a buyer that's kicking the tires. Correct. And if you're prepared to waste your own time or prepared to waste other people's time, well then that's just a sad reflection of yep. what you're up to. Now you're a um, an experienced auctioneer. Yeah. Um, if you could jump over this side of the fence for the buyer, what yep. what's the best advice you can give to buyers on how they can better um, prepare themselves to, to win at auction? Because clearly you're there to get the best outcome. Yep, absolutely. But, um, but what are the mistakes you see <laughs> look, buyers make? Uh, quite often buyers will hold back in their bidding. You know, when I bid for people, uh, and I've done that umpteen times, quite often I'll open the bidding, right? I want to open the bidding. I much prefer to open the bidding than let the vend- than the auctioneer take a vendor bid. And Why is that? Well, you get a better sense of who your competition are, right? When I'm competing and bidding on behalf of people, I'll stand not next to the auctioneer, but on a similar parallel so I can see the crowd and I can watch their body language and I can watch their movements and I'll give them an opening bid. I always try and get on the right side of the auctioneer because I'd much prefer then if 
it, through the, the auction and at the biddings, and I'm at a limit where I need to make a call, if I've been congruent with the auctioneer and I haven't really upset the apple cut, he's more likely to give me a bit of time. So I see him as a friend rather than a foe. Even competing agents and auctioneers always try and bid freely, bid openly, be quite candid in my bidding. Uh, I don't subscribe to the concept that you bid right at the end. I think you want to bid early and exert some influence and show people that you're here to buy, mm. right? And you're, you're quite reasonable about it. So I'll often bid quite, when I say quickly, I won't drag it out, first call, second call, then bid. He calls for a bid, I'll give him a bid. Mm. And no, I was going to say, just extending on that in terms of um, negotiating, yep. you know, what are some of the sort of tips you could give in just general, say, private treaty negotiations that you think... Um, would, would give the advantage to a buyer? Well, from a buyer's point of view, I think they want to know as much information as they can. So things like settlement times always give a, bit, a buyer a bit of an indication. You know, yeah. um, if the vendor's looking for a long settlement, that tells them that the, the reality is that the vendor's either hasn't made a purchase or he's got a settlement. If you can work in, have an understanding, again, what the vendor wants to achieve and then try and work within that. So I always start with the settlement, right? If I can get the settlement right, then that's one thing ticked and then we can move through the pricing and the negotiations on the price. But if you've got, if you're battling on two fronts, I think it's always hard. If you can get one front right, then work on the others, I think you've got a better chance of success. Very good, so um, you're a big fan of Property as an asset class. Have yep. you have you diversified? Are you are you a, you know this clearly shares in yep. the business, but outside of that, or are you stick to your knitting? Ah, uh, look, I do stick to my knitting a bit, and um, my financial advisor suggested I should balance my portfolio a little bit. But uh, yeah, so you have houses and units. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but um, he'll be listening to this. Yeah, too. I know. That's, I'm a bit nervous about that. But um, yeah, look, I I think. I'm one of the, again, I'm Scottish and I'm not that well educated and I like to know it's real. If I can touch it and see it and feel it, it's there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've played with shares and all that sort of stuff at times and you wake up and it's down 10% or up 20% and all the rest of it. And I just think it, for my personality, I'm better with bricks and mortar. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll leave it at that. (laughs) Um, Why bother? What's what's the point? Why build a portfolio for the McPherson family? Um, Well, I guess it comes from your background and, and what aspirations you have. Um, in many regards, I've got a fairly simple philosophy and that, that is to make myself redundant. Now I mean that as a father and as a parent, but also as a business owner, that I wanna make sure that um, A, I leave things better than I found them, but B, I can uh, elevate people and educate people and, and nurture people to be the best they can be. And that might make me redundant, but then at the end of the day, I've again, I've helped people achieve their goals and I think that's how I achieve mine. So I think it's a wonderful class and I think, you know, I feel really a bit, um, all this conversation about property prices and young people not being able to get into property, I'm, I'm mindful of that, but it's never been easy and I'd make that point to the listeners in the sense that when I bought my first property in Melbourne, we were paying 18% interest. Now, the young generation don't understand that and they think it's it's all hard now. It was equally hard then, let me tell you, when you're trying to make your mortgage repayments. But um, so I think property is a great asset class. It is one of those things that through generations acquires wealth. And um, I think that's what basically I aspire to. And obviously, you know, we talk about time. That's because that's the finite thing that we've yep. got. By making other people redundant, you're able to then take a five-week holiday in Europe, which is now. great to see your <laughs> son working overseas. Yeah. They're, they're the great things. I mean, because ultimately, Absolutely. you know, there's that. And then there's, in your case, you mentioned it's the legacy. Yes. So, you know, it's different for different people. Correct. Uh, yeah. In some cases, it, it may be about getting them the best education. You know, and it could be a combination of all of those things as well. So whatever your why... Or whatever what motivates you is the reason we do what we do. I yep. mean, it's just simply a bricks and mortar bank account, isn't it? It's Correct. A, certainly yep. is. I, I, you're a you're an example of. Uh, so you've been investing for thirty years. How, when what year well, was the first one? Uh, the first well, the first one was that little church or uh, school I bought, and then from there, uh, getting established with kids and families. Then I think I bought my first investment property. Oh, that. 20 years ago, I suppose. I never get sick of talking to people who have been doing it for the long term. Now, here's a resource that, and I know that the Nelson Alexander family is all about getting amongst your team and creating a really great culture. Have you found many sales agents sort of saddle up next to you when you're having a quiet beer and say, tell me a bit about this long-term investing? Because in my observation of people, not not the Nelson Alexander brand, but a lot of the sales agents 
they say I've got to get around to it. I've got to, you know, I'm, I'm going to... Yep. And so they're, they've got this front row seat of um, watching day in, day out, the best, in our view, the mm. best asset class going around. Correct, yep. But not a lot of them accumulate Practice like you have. Do you, yep. do, I guess my question is two parts. Why, why don't a lot of sales agents... And B, are you finding people approach you to be their mentor? I guess it comes down to personalities and, and there's always different personalities that look for different things in life and maybe it's a smart car and not the investment property. Um, I, I don't want to Is judge that the them for that. Because a lot of a lot of real estate agents have a $2,500 a month car lease. That, yeah. uh, stops it's the only thing that's tax deductible, that's why. <laughs> 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 you get paid a car allowance, your models yeah. will use it. Yeah. You know what I mean? yeah. So I think that's part of the reason. And plus, you spend so much time in your car, so your models will be comfortable. But your priorities change o- over time. Um, but yeah, look, when I, uh, I have individual meetings with all my staff, and I always sort of uh, want to have an understanding of where they're at, not just in their career because I know where they're at, I know the figures they're writing and all the rest of it, but I want to know what their goals are, short, medium and long term, I want to know when they've got holidays planned, I want to know what, you know, how things are at home and what's what's the process there and I encourage them to get involved with property because I do think it's it's the way they can really get ahead over a period of time mm. and yeah. take it, you know, it's little steps. Um, and sometimes, you know, and this is something perhaps it's worth talking about and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it as well. Um, where, you know, I know the market's strong at the moment, I know it's hard for people to get in. But I took a position some years ago where I had a like-minded friend and we decided we'd do it together. And that, to some people, is a bit dangerous, but we had shareholders or or unit holders agreements, so we got a unit holders agreement written up by a solicitor so that we knew if I toppled off the perch or got hit by a bus or something happened and I wanted out, we had a process that we mm. went through that mm. everyone was adhering to. And, you know, for, for young people in the marketplace that want to get in and find it struggling on their own, if they could get a like-minded friend and, and buy something together with the right structure in place and use that as a, as a foothold into the marketplace, I think it's still very doable. I think you're right. I mean, we talk about uh, definitely having an agreement, Yep. a buy-sell agreement, in your case a unit a trust or a shareholders agreement in some cases. We also talk about um, five years. Yes. So, so there's an you know if you if one wants out uh, in the five year period, you only get out the initial that you put in. Yep. So you're not getting anything more. So there's a financial penalty for cutting it short because yep. with younger people, what they've also got to look at is if they partner up. And then also their priorities change and then there's pressures on weddings and honeymoons. Yep. and all. It's normally like, where's my cash? Or my cash is caught up in that property. Correct. Can I get out? So if you have some really stringent um, opportunity, first right first right of refusal, those yep. types of things need to be drafted into them. I totally agree. I yep. think if you get it structured correctly, because I mean, I've seen it, you know, uh, hurt relationships. I, I went into a three-way boat once. We, I was <laughs> big on my, uh, my freshwater fishing and, and I had two other mates who I said, let's go and buy a boat together. And Did you have I a moved, sinking fund? I moved to Queensland <laughs> and I never used the boat. They were using the boat all the time and then all of a sudden one of them, you know, situation changed and I had a $1,000 fa- fish finder on this boat, which I bought and they didn't have the boat. <laughs> and they're like, they tried to sell it with a fish finder on it. <laughs> so, yeah, it happens. So hence, have an agreement in place. And, yeah, yeah, have it all. Have it all done. <laughs> your eyes dotted and your T's crossed and work from there. But you know the happiest day you, when you, when you buy a boat, the happiest days the day you buy it and the day you sell it. That's what <laughs> yeah, I've been told. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. I just hire boats now. You're right. You get this uh, uh, being a country lad. I remember when I grew up in Perth, we went to the Perth Royal Show. They had the rides on the outside, then they had the oval in the middle, and we'd be yeah. looking at um, all the farmers' prize cows. And I'd be sitting there. And I remember sitting next to someone who knew what they're talking about, going, "Have a look at that cow." And I'm thinking. It's black. It's white. You know, four <laughs> legs. But they could see the they could see stuff that I couldn't see, even though we were looking at the same thing. Yeah. So with that as a backdrop, what what do you see when you pull up to a property? You step out of the car, and someone who hasn't seen as many transactions, seen as many properties as you, wouldn't see. Do you you know, in terms of looking at the property, is there is there a routine? Is there things that you notice? Is there stuff that um, that you've caught um, over twenty plus years of doing this that others would miss? Look, I you know, it's a, a bit of a uh, interesting story with location and I mean it's the oldest catch cry in the, in the world but you know quite often we find country people buy on busy roads and people say well what, how does that work and I said it's really simple when country people come to town Melbourne's busy mm. like it's busy there's traffic and there's everything happening everywhere so they think busy road is a busy road they don't understand that if you go around the corner you can find a little cul-de-sac or a no through road or a quiet street and they think everything's busy so they buy on busy roads so you know th- th- those sorts of things uh, come foremost to my mind like location is critically important 
Again, amenity and convenience, they're the sorts of things to look at. But can I add value to it? What's the land component to it? What could I do that would improve the property? Um, you know, a small cosmetic change, look at the floor plan, how could you work that better? You know, a lot of people these days, and again, I'm sounding old, but you know, once upon a time, you only had one bathroom. Right, but everyone wants two bathrooms these days. How can I get another bathroom into this property? Where Does a floor plan work for that? If I make a change here, can I add some value to it? They're the things, it's a bit like the old Beef Wellington, isn't it? How can I add some value? Yeah, where, where do you put the pad over? <laughs> okay, so I'm into best property deal or you know, what's one of your deals that you've done that you're still sitting on or whatever. That you may not have materialised, but just a great story of a great property you've bought and what it's sort of done for you. Um, gee... There's, there's different properties that have all had different aspects to them, I suppose, but um, there, the property that we bought in, um, in Q that had the added, added land component that we then further developed and then sold out, that was, that was a, a good deal. A good deal. Yep. Um, but some of the other ones that, and I think it's just timing, you know, you buy them and you think they're fair market value at the time and you always like to buy as well as you can, but time's your great healer. Like, mm. you look back now and you think, God, what was I... I paid a little, bought a single front in Brunswick for 160000 I thought it was huge money at the Gosh, time. <laughs> and I look back now and go, ah, oh, maybe that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no time heals okay. all wounds. <laughs> what, what, what impresses you when you walk into a property? I mean, it'd be hard to impress these days. You've uh, seen a lot of things. Yeah, I've seen a lot of things. But, you know, one of the critical things I give to my vendors when I'm listing a property or when I'm helping them present it to market is just um, declutter make it look as spacious as possible and sometimes and I've, I've got one property on the market at the moment that my vendor's uh, in Western Australia in Perth mm -hmm. he'd lived in the property he'd rented it out the tenants moved out and I had a look at it and I said well what we need to do is spend a bit of dough on this to to really maximize it so we polished the boards and gave it a coat of paint and put some new carpet in and furnished it and it just transformed the whole house mm. and the response we've had from the marketplace has been very positive it's a property that I that I'd buy in the sense that it's got a north facing backyard it's got potential to improve but it's got some really good bones so you know you want to make sure even a property like that that is a little down at heel that people can move in and enjoy it to start with mm. just make it as welcoming as possible to start with and they can add the value down mm. the track. Mm. Uh, very good. So the, the best piece of real estate advice you've been given? Best, uh, well, I reckon it comes back to my old Jewish gentleman, mm. land and airspace. Mm. Yeah. Well, That's what you're good. buying. I think it's a good one. Um, what does financial freedom mean to you? Uh, uh, being in a position where I can provide for my family and my kids what I hope to you know what I want to provide them with and give them opportunities that perhaps I didn't have and it's not through no fault of my parents I have, I have wonderful parents and they gave me the best they could give me but I think every generation wants to take that next step forward and uh, provide them with the opportunity to um, build on what Amanda and I have accumulated and, and go from there but uh, I think to start with my my when I first got married and had kids, my biggest focus was education. Mm. Maybe because it was my own lack of education that I had, and that probably wasn't my parents' fault, that was probably my fault, but I wanted to give them, make sure I gave them the best education I could give them. And uh, I'm very pleased with both their educations and the kids that they turned out to be, so, mm. so far so good. And, and you guys, are you're paying it forward now, aren't you? You've set up the foundation. Yep. So do you want to talk to us a little bit about the foundation that you... Yeah, well, the foundation's something that's very dear to my heart. The Nelson Alexanderville Charitable Foundation, we started in 2005, and I went to the board with a concept that each individual office was doing certain things within the community, and I, I asked their permission to set up the foundation, which they totally embraced, uh, where we pool our resources and then and do some wonderful things. We think we've I think we've just about now um, generated close to 2.5 million dollars that we've spread throughout the community. There's two elements to it. One is Foundation Day, which we have once a year, where each of the 16 offices auctions a property, and the commission earned out of that property is donated to a local cause. This year on Foundation Day, I think we raised $276,000 that was uh, distributed through the community. And then we have the Foundation Committee, which meets monthly, and we have a small uh, grants program where we can do certain things for certain things that crop up. And um, it's one of the great things that's really added to and enhanced our culture as a company where anyone that works for Nelson Alexander can nominate to be on the committee uh, and on the committee it's a voluntary position but they're involved in distributing funds and supporting people within the community which is great. 
Including youth and, and not, you know... Well, like the, the focus of the foundation is, is very much on education yeah. and, uh, and youth. Um, that's where we really like to direct our attention and we've had some wonderful, um, wonderful outcomes out of that. Um, mm. One example would be um, a couple of years ago the Brunswick Secondary College ap- uh, approached us for Foundation Day funding and we supported them through a grants program for underprivileged kids that were musically talented but couldn't afford instrument hire or lessons and also kids doing VCE that were struggling to do some of the VCE camps where they get enhanced learning. So we supported that process for a 12-month period. Brilliant. And then um, I think a year and a bit later, uh, the principal rang me and said, Duncan, I don't know if you can help with this one. This one's a bit curly. But we had um, some Sudanese uh, orphans, refugees, and they were orphans. And they were um, two brothers that had lost their parents and they'd come to Australia to live with an auntie. And the auntie and the husband, unfortunately weren't working all that together, so they were sort of crowd surfing, or couch surfing, sorry. Mm -hmm. And um, they approached us to see if we could help in some regard. So I approached one of our landlords that was sympathetic, and basically the foundation paid half the rent uh, until both those kids finished high school. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we're then in a position to support the auntie. So they're the sorts of things that we can do. And because we're not a gift recipient, registered as a gift recipient, if you give me $10, I can't give you a receipt for that $10. But the bonus of that is if you give me $10, I can spend that $10 where I deem it necessary. So it does give us wonderful flexibility. Brilliant, brilliant. That's it, that's what it's all about, paying it forward. Terrific initiative, I guess. Uh, for me, the, the final thing, Ben, is um, you've been operating in a marketplace that's done really well for the last five years. What's yeah. what's your view of the Melbourne marketplace going forward? Have we tapped out, turned the lights off and... Uh, we certainly uh, haven't turned the lights off. Uh, no, no, I don't, think we've, we, I don't think we've turned the lights out, but I do believe that everything goes in cycles and, and if you look at property over a period of time, the overall trajectory is up, but there are bumps along the way. And I do think we've had a sustained period of growth, and I think that will settle. Mm. Uh, I don't think that we can expect the same growth in the next five years that we've had in the last five years. I think that's a little unrealistic. But I am a great believer in property as a long-term investment strategy. But I do think there'll be a bit of a, a bit of a heats come out of the market, and I think there's just a bit of a, uh, a breathe or a sigh that will happen through. And... I think that will present some opportunities for those uh, in a position to take advantage of them. From this side of the fence, we've been waiting for this, haven't we? Been? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted a bit of a cool we, market. We've been waiting for this. A bit less competition. Um, last one for me, Ben. I know I said that was my last yeah, one. Yeah. This is my last, last, last one. Last, last. Um, uh, who, who is who is your first mentor, um, and was it um, Peter Nelson, or was it because you f- spoke fondly of him? Well, yeah, I, I love Peter Nelson. Um, my first mentor was probably my dad, and the, the lesson he taught me was to, he said, I don't care what you do, mate, but be the best you can be. My second mentor was probably my footy coach that sort of installed in me the concept that hard work and determination can get you further than natural ability. Thank God for that. <laughs> uh, and my third mentor would be Peter Nelson, who... Um, his concept was to, and again my fellow directors Arch and Paul, um, and our philosophy has been, and I'd classify them as mentors still, and they're still business partners, but is to just to build a bigger pie. Don't worry about your slice of the pie. If you build a bigger pie, there'll be more for everyone, and as such, there'll be more for you. So that's uh, probably the thought I'd leave you with. Mm, Brilliant stuff. Yeah, that's been good. fantastic. Well, uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned, Ben, we're, we're very lucky to have Duncan come on. I think, um, you know, there's, a, there's, there's investors have done well in the last five minutes, Ben, but mm-hmm. uh, people who've been doing it for a long period of time are the people that you want to listen to and the fundamentals that they totally. still. So um, we certainly appreciate you doing that, Duncan. Before We'll come back to you, but before we go, Ben, I've got to do my life hack. Please. And what have we got? So, <laughs> um, I know you're going to laugh, so I'm, I'm ready for it. Uh... <laughs> he started laughing himself. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready for the put down. I don't put you down, mate. I just get behind you and encourage mate, you. Lift you up. You're just the encourager, aren't I just you, lift you up. Just, uh, how, how good was uh, that fight back from Adelaide a couple of weeks ago with the yeah, yeah, we'll 50, move 50 on from that. down? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I'll get so you on your phone, when you, when you, on your iPhone, of course I'm not an Android user, I yeah, ask yeah, Ivis yeah. for some life hacks and uh-huh. she just gives just, here's an wow. opportunity, Ivis. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we go. So... If you go um, on your iPhone, Ben, you can. Um, there's a bedtime setting underneath. So you drag it up, you yes. go to the time, and there's a bedtime setting. It actually tells you when to go to bed 
and when you wake up. Not only that, it sends you a little notification half an hour before you need to go to bed, just in case you're uh, stuck oh. watching the... So your circadian rhythms, it's, yep. it's reading and, all of that and, and telling you... I love the way you think, Ben, because it actually then gives you your sleep analysis. All oh. done. You don't have to get a nap. It already does. It tells you when you're snoring, oh, when you're not. So why, I'm, I'm not paying out on that. That's good. I'll, I'll, what um, happens if I go to bed at 1am like I do every morning? Well, it'll tell you, mate. <laughs> you're and not I'm, getting enough sleep. And, and I'm a bit, be dead by and I'm a bit worried because we're going to America in a few weeks' time and I'm uh, room sharing with this guy. And rumour has it that I'm going to need some heavy-duty earplugs. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Snores like a D8 you tractor. Don't get these, <laughs> don't get these nostrils <laughs> for nothing. So, um, so that's my life. Fact, Ben, if you've got an iPhone, and Ibis, you might help us out if you can do the same on an Android, but uh, uh, there's a bedtime section that you can just uh, get into because routine is what uh, it is. is what sets um, the successful people apart. So I agree. Did you know? Did you know? Just some fun facts, Bryce, if I can read what I've got in front of me. Did you know that the Earth has travelled more than 5,000 miles in the past five minutes? Fair dinkum. 5,000 miles. Couldn't you have found it in kilometres? I would have been able to well, reference it. Just one point. Was it 1.2? <laughs> something like 2.1? Something like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just double it. Man, that's a lot, isn't it? That's last a five lot. Minutes. That's a lot. Did you know that avocado are poisonous to birds? No, I didn't know that. Did you know that avocado is great for pregnant women and it takes nine months to for it to ripen? And then if you do a cross section, it looks like the womb. Hey, how good is that? Tomatoes are good for the heart. Cross section of the tomato, See, it's like the heart. Told you, told you, yes, Carrots, grass. cross section of the carrot, looks like the eye. There we go, just a few little freebies for oh, you. Oh, jeez, full of wisdom. I'm yeah. learning something today. <laughs> <laughs> and Duncan, this one's for you. Did you know that the average person spends six months of their lifetime waiting at a red light to turn green? Now, for you real estate agents getting through traffic. That's plenty of text messages you're going probably, on there. You'd probably, probably be double there or something like that, wouldn't you? Understand? That's frightening. You're not one for it. Yeah, the country boy doesn't like traffic like the rest of us. <laughs> Last one, here we go. Um, if you believe that you're truly one in a million, there are still approximately 7.184 more people out there than just that are just like you. <laughs> so basically 7.1 billion, you yeah. think you're one in a million, you're 7,000. 184 people. 7,184, just like us, just Ben. Like that's just like you, man. <laughs> uh, uh, very good. That was good, mate. Very insightful, did you know? But um, again, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, Duncan. Thanks for uh, joining us. Good Thank luck you. With the, Thanks um, for having me, fellas. With the new brand. Good luck with the uh, the trip overseas to see your son. Looking forward to all of it. There we go. We've whipped through it. We have. Yes. Whipped through it. Yeah. So, um, Ben, I'm going to throw it over to you. I'm not, I don't try and stump you anymore because you always... Yep. Just remember that knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. Only if you act on it. But, uh, until next week, see you later. See you later.